Hey, City Family, this is Apostle O. I am so excited to be back with you once again. Yes, we've made it to another week. And uh, with that being said, I'm excited for this opportunity to break bread with you. Um, you're in our Bible study experience. To those that are joining us for the first time, welcome to the core experience. We're so glad to have you a part of this broadcast. With that being said, I want to make sure that you are welcomed. So, uh, please go ahead and drop where you're hailing from. In other words, what city or state uh, you're watching this broadcast. We'd love to celebrate and acknowledge you as well. So glad uh, that you chose to be a part of this um, uh, study experience with us. Now, to get the best view of this broadcast, we ask that you simply enlarge your screen at this present moment so that you can, you know, get rid of those pesky uh, broad, uh, broadcasts or notifications that so much uh, distract us. And um, if you have the ability, go ahead and mirror this with your television right now. This is a great time to do so. Again, welcome to The Core Experience. Tonight, you are going to hear from one of my spiritual sons. I'm so grateful to share him with you. He's a treasure. He's a gift in that of Tyree Grooms. Listen, up, up and coming minister, up and coming youth, uh, I mean, pastor, you name it, it's, it's, it's all in him. And I'm sure you are going to enjoy and relish in the anointing on his life. Tyreek, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling wonderful. And I was sitting there listening to you speak on myself and was wondering, was that about me? But I'm, oh, I'm, just, uh, I'm just absolutely humbled and uh, honored to uh, have this opportunity to share with you all. God bless you. God bless you. In a moment, you're going to hear from him, folks. And listen, um, I might as well go ahead and get this out of the way because I know how the Holy Spirit can take over even a broadcast like this. If you so desire to support this ministry, in fact, we encourage you to do so. You may go ahead and right now and sow your seed. Information will be on screen for you in a matter of how you can do that. Of course, you're going to need a couple of things. You're going to need your Bible today and you're going to need something to take notes with. So please, by all means, get that now so that you can enjoy and, you know, recollect all that you are um, about to receive. Uh, listen, I'm going to move out of the way and I'm going to let my son have it now. Um, so welcome again. I'll be back. Uh, don't go anywhere. At the end of the broadcast, I do have a quick announcement for you, one or two, and I want to share with you. I'm excited for doing so. God bless you. Go ahead, uh, Brother Tariq. Let's hear from you and what the Lord has laid on your heart. Amen. Thank you so much, Apostle, again, for the opportunity. Uh, as Apostle has already said, welcome to everyone. My name is Brother Tyreek Grooms, and I am excited to share this word that the Lord has given me. I do believe it is a relevant word and a rhema word uh, that will bless your hearts on tonight. Let's have a brief word of prayer and dive right into scripture. Father, in the name of Jesus, dear Lord, we thank you, God, for this day, for this hour, for this evening. Oh God, wherever and whenever your people will consume this content, we pray that it blesses their life and enriches them and edifies them. We pray that you use me to your glory and it is done now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to make the best use of the time. So as Apostles has said, if you haven't already, go ahead and grab your Bible, your tablet, your laptop, however you consume the scripture. Uh, let's dive right in and go to 2 Timothy chapter 4 at verse 5. 2 Timothy 4 and 5. This is going to be our foundational verse for the study on tonight. Uh, we're going to leave 2 Timothy and then head into the book of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 through 34. And I'll give those verses again for anyone who may have missed it. Again, it's 2 Timothy 4 and 5. And then we're going to jump over to Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 34. All right. I'm going to be reading from the King James Version. And ready, set, read. Let's start at 2 Timothy 4 and 5. This is our dear Apostle Paul talking to his son, Timothy, his son in the faith. And he is giving him some final instructions here. He says, but watch thou in all things, endure afflictions do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry, okay? So he doesn't just give him one or two things to do, but he tells him first to watch, right? Then he says endure, do the work of an evangelist, and then that fourth thing is where we're going to be talking tonight, 
make full proof of thy ministry. So tonight's Bible study topic is going to be a full proof ministry, not full proof, but full, F-U-L-L, a full proof ministry. And to see what that looks like, to see that on display, we're going to head over to the book of Luke chapter 10. And we're going to start at verse 25. Very familiar scripture. I'm sure you all probably learned it even in Sunday school, but it's still relevant even today. All right, let's read together. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, what is written in the law? This is how Jesus responds. He responds to a question with a question, right? And he says, what is written in the law? How readest thou? Or rather, how do you understand or interpret what you have read? And the lawyer answering him said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. Verse 28. We're going to read through it, and then we're going to go back and break it down scripture by scripture. Verse 28 says, And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. But he willing to justify himself. Right? He couldn't just take that answer. He had to come back with another response. He says unto Jesus, And who? is my neighbor. And verse 30 says, and Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him, stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. 31 says, and by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Last verse says, and he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Actually, we're going to go one more verse. My apologies. Let's get that 35th verse in there as well, because we want to get, again, the complete work of what this man did. The 35th verse says, and on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more When I come again, I will repay thee. Now, again, we're talking from the topic tonight, a foolproof ministry. And oftentimes we can have it in our mind what we think that is or what that looks like. Maybe we envision, even as young ministers like myself, we envision perhaps preaching and teaching and uh, uh, even teaching in this capacity, perhaps laying on of hands, and you, you know, God has given you visions of uh, laying on the laying your hands on the sick and watching them recover and casting out devils and demons. Um, but what exactly is a foolproof ministry? What does it look like? Is it all of the things that we mention only? Is it preaching only? Is it teaching only? Is it laying hands only? Or is there more to it? Uh, and we want to we want to dive into that tonight and open up your understanding, and hopefully by the end of this broadcast you'll have a full, uh, a full clear understanding of what this foolproof ministry looks like, uh, and we actually just read about it. So let's go back, let's dive into the scriptures and really break this down because this is very meaty, uh, it's a rich scripture, uh, and we don't want to uh, leave anything undone, uh, and we'll. Uh, We'll come back to that in a little bit. So let's go back to verse 25, right? A certain lawyer. Now, this isn't the lawyer uh, in the sense that we know it today, uh, an attorney who would operate within the realms of uh, a courtroom 
uh, and you know, whether it be a, a prosecutor or a defense attorney, uh, this was a, a lawyer uh, in the, within the realms of the Old Testament scripture. Um, for a, a reference, you can go to Luke chapter 2 and 46, uh, and that passage of scripture talks about young Jesus, uh, how he uh, slipped away from his parents and he was found in the temple with the teachers and doctors of the law. These were uh, men who studied the law day in and day out and were masters of the law that God had given to Moses. Um, so because Jesus has now come on the scene, he has really upset these lawyers and kind of wreaked havoc, uh, if you will, in uh, turning their world upside down. Uh, and so whenever they could, they would challenge him and they would come after him and try to discredit him uh, however they could do that. And oftentimes they would pose questions. Uh, another example uh, is where they tried to trip him up, you know, with the, the, the woman who was caught in adultery. Um, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they had minor different beliefs, but they were on one accord. Isn't that funny how people who don't always believe the same thing, but somehow or another they can kind of uh, put their differences aside when it comes to coming up against God's people, when it comes to coming up against you, right? They're not all that close. They have different beliefs, uh, but they are in solidarity in, in attacking you. But nevertheless, we'll move on from that. That's another, another lesson. But this man was a master of Moses's law. And so he poses this question. And if you'll notice as I mentioned earlier, Jesus responds with wisdom. He responds to the question with the question. Uh, as the man asks, what shall I do to inherit e eternal life? Uh, he says, what is written? You know, you know the Bible. I know you know the Bible. I know you know the, the law of Moses. What is it? What is written? What, you know, what does it say? And the man answers with scripture. Again, a master of the law. Isn't it funny? something to consider here. This man knows the word. He knows what is written, but would it be fair to say that he is not actually living what is written? It's not enough to just know it and have it in our minds, but we must also have it in our hearts. Let's move on. So he says to him and actually quotes scripture. Uh, he quotes Deuteronomy 6 and 5, and he also quotes Leviticus 19 and 18. And he says it very plainly that if I want to inherit eternal life, Jesus, that I've got to Lord, love the Lord thy God with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength, and all my mind, and I've got to love my neighbor as myself. Now, Jesus is willing to leave it there. He's not looking for a debate. He's not looking for argument. He's, he's willing to leave it right there. And he says, you have answered correctly. Just do this right? Just do this and you shall live. But again, the man wanting to trip Jesus up, you know, wanting to, uh, to kind of throw him off base and, and discredit him and make him look bad in front of the crowd, he says to him, uh, well, that's, that, we, we don't want to stop there. Who is my neighbor, right? I know it says that I'm to love my neighbor, but who exactly is my neighbor? And I believe the man asked this because he, along with the group that he was a part of, had already decided who their neighbors were. They had already decided that if you look a certain way, or if you are of a certain background, if you are of a certain race, of a certain creed, even a certain sex, because at this time, women were not even treated fairly and and and. Uh, the, the way they should have been, right? So they had already decided if you fit into certain categories, you're not my neighbor and you're not worthy of my love. You're not deserving of my love. And Jesus discerned this. He discerned this type of prejudice and he responds beautifully uh, with this parable. There's so much wisdom in Jesus's response that we can take note of. You know, he didn't have to yell. He didn't have to insult the man. And it should always be noted, disagreement is not disrespect. 
Just because someone disagrees with you, that does not necessarily mean that they disrespect you as a person, but merely they disagree with that point. And Jesus always, again, God Almighty in the flesh, right? What mistakes did he make? None. So he answers perfectly. And he says, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Look at someone in your house, high five yourself and say he was half dead, which means there was still life there, which means what is remaining can be strengthened, right? We hear that over in the book of Revelation, strengthen the things that remain. There was something left in this man. He was not dead. The Bible says that he was half dead. And so we want to dive into our lesson now. And really, that was just a little appetizer. That was a little salad. Let's get into the main course now. We really want to look at this parable and see what God is saying to us uh, as it pertains to this season. Okay. So this poor man was on a road traveling, minding his business, fell, falls among thieves, is stripped of his raiment, beaten half to death. And the Bible says, by chance, there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Now, what's the significance of the priest? Why did Jesus decide to use a priest as one of the character, characters in his parable? He, I believe he chose a priest to show uh, and represent the religious sect that he was speaking to. Because the priest was very well respected and very revered, right, within the holy city of Jerusalem, okay? And Jesus is showing that, and it, I want you all to take a note of this. In verse 31, it says, there came down a certain priest. This is, it may look insignificant, but it's very important because Jesus wants everyone to know that the man is coming down from Jerusalem. OK, he's coming down. Jerusalem, as we all know, was a city set on a hill. Right. That's where that verse comes from. A city set on a hill which cannot be hid with the light of the world. Jerusalem actually is above sea level. And we'll get into that some more of that later. But he's literally coming down from the holy city. To this other city, Jericho. Now, the significance of that is the law states that the priest could not touch any dead thing before he was going to perform his temple duties. So if he was leaving Jericho and coming into Jerusalem, it would make sense for him to pass over on the other side because there was a chance that he could break or violate the law. I can't touch this dead man, this man that I perceive to be dead. I can't even go over there and, and make a mistake and touch him, I have to keep going because I'm on my way to perform my temple duties, whether it be uh, offering a sacrifice, whether it be play, praying in the holy place, whatever it was, I can't touch this dead man. It would make sense for him to pass over on the other side if that was the case. But Jesus says that he's coming down, which means he's leaving Jerusalem. You are leaving the holy place. Your temple duties have been completed. You are absolved from the law right now because you have done, you have just done what you needed to do. But in spite of the fact you are leaving the presence of God, in spite of the fact that you are leaving his temple, in spite of the fact that you just perform your temple duties, you are leaving there without loving your heart. And I want to challenge every believer who comes in contact with this video, with this broadcast. How many of you are going to church, performing your churchly duties, whether it be singing in the praise team, being a, mu a musician, uh, being a greeter, being a preacher, pastor, teacher, a prophet, an intercessor? How many of you are performing those duties within the four walls of the church? But when you leave that holy place, you are struggling to find love in your heart for your neighbor. Something for you to consider. I could stay on that a long time, but I'm going to move on. I got to stay focused. So the priest passes him by, even though technically he could have stopped and offered some aid to the man and not been in violation of the law. 
Let's move on. Verse 32 says, likewise, a Levite. This is not a priest, uh, but Levites were of the priesthood order, if you will, uh, the, the Levitical order. So they are working with the priests. Uh, this is someone that we may have considered in today's uh, model of church, a deacon or perhaps a minister or maybe even a minister of music because the Levites were skilled musicians as well uh, in the Old Testament. So again, this is a believer, right? This is someone who works within the temple, understands scripture, no doubt would know Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy 6, okay, and 5, and Leviticus 19 and 18, where it says that we should love our neighbor no doubt knows those scriptures, but still chooses to pass by on the other side. I'm going to say it one more time and we'll move on. How many of you, the Lord is having me to stick here for a moment. How many of you are going to church, performing your duties, singing and praising God on Sundays, but when you leave out of the church and it's time to put the things that you have shouted about to test, when it's time to put the things that you have testified about to test, how many of you are passing that test with flying colors and actually showing love to your neighbor? Paul makes it very clear that we can have every gift in the world. We can prophesy until we're blue in the face. We can speak in tongues like no other, but it is all a tinkling symbol if we don't have love. And we see these examples right here in front of our eyes. The priests, the Levite, they are merely temp tinkling symbols because they were not able to display the love of Jesus Christ. They were not able to display the love of the Father in spite of working very closely with him, in spite of working in the temple. Now, verse 33, but a Samaritan, a Samaritan, Jesus is very intentional here. He uses a Samaritan because, as we learned uh, with the, his interaction, Jesus' interaction with the woman at the well in John 4, I believe, she says it very plainly, you, your people don't have any dealings with my people. The Samaritans and the Jews had a fallen out years before Jesus came on to see on the scene way back in the Old Testament, you can read about it in your own time. But I, I'm, I'm pointing this out to let you all know, uh, in, in this climate of times, with all that is going on, and with social justice and, and so many uh, who are out there protesting and fighting for change, I want the saints and the body of Christ to know, if you don't know already, racism isn't anything new. It isn't something that started here in America. It isn't something that just started with African Americans and Caucasians, black and whites. There are examples of it here in scripture. And Jesus uses the Samaritan because he's wanting to tear down a stronghold. He's wanting to break, oh, glory to God. He's wanting to break a spirit that is amongst the lawyer and those who are with him. And he wants to show them that even though you all know the word, even though you all are experts in the scripture, someone who doesn't even know scripture, someone who may not be as well versed in understanding the Bible is doing something that you should be doing as a believer. Okay. So he says, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Let's stop there. I want to talk to you first, if you're taking notes, this is my first point. The mindset of the Good Samaritan. We're going to talk for a few minutes about the mindset of the Good Samaritan. And we're also going to talk about his, willing, his willingness to go through the full process of ministry. Okay? So he stops and has compassion on the man. And I love that Jesus says this, before he, before he gets off his own animal, before, whether it was a donkey or horse, whatever, 
before he gets off his animal, Jesus highlights the spirit of compassion that is in this man's heart, and it also points to his mindset, okay? And he recognizes the immediate need regarding the wounded man's past, okay? So ministry, when it's done in the manner of it being foolproof, it addresses the wounded's past, it addresses their present, and it addresses their future. So here, the man is first going to deal with what happened to this poor man, okay? So he was selfless enough to alter his own journey because remember, he's already traveling. He's already got a destination. He already has somewhere to be, but he's selfless. He says, you know what? I know I have somewhere to be. I know I have business to tend to, but I'm going to put this man before my own needs. I'm going to put this man before myself, and I'm going to alter my journey for the sake of my fellow man. And I think in today's society, what is happening, a lot of people, uh, the body of Christ in particular, a lot of churches are feeling as if people are asking them to forsake their journey. No one is telling you to stop preaching the gospel. No one is telling you to abandon your God-given assignment. But I think what the masses are crying out for in this day and age, and in this season in particular, I believe what they are asking you to do is not to abandon your journey, but alter your journey. There is somebody who has fallen on the side of the road. Will you continue? as usual or will you put yourself on the back burner for just a moment to alter your journey for the sake of your fellow man okay i want to look at the next thing that happens verse 34 says he went to him and bound up his wounds even even just the beginning of verse 34 and he went to him that is a powerful act in itself being willing to leave where I am, my place of comfortability, my place of safety, and go to this man who I don't know, who could be setting me up. There could be robbers in the bushes or around the corner waiting to get me, right? I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave my place of safety and my place of comfort to go and see about someone else, someone else right? He... he he has to get off of his animal. I want you to think about this. Because later in verse 34, it says that he set the man on his own beast. So we can make an inference and say that he, before he put the man on there, he was on the animal, right? So watch this. He comes down from an elevated place. How many of us are willing to do that? Once God has lifted us up, once God has exalted us, once God has elevated us, how many of us are willing to come down from that elevated place to help someone up, right? This is the mark of a foolproof ministry. We are seeing it on display. So he gets off his animal from that high place, right, and comes down. One preacher called it, I'll let you figure out who that preacher is. You can Google it in your own time. But one preacher called it a dangerous unselflessness. A dangerous unselflessness. Google that. A dangerous unselflessness. Right? Now, he understood the risk. Again, this is a dangerous road. We're going to get into more of that later. But he understands, I'm in a, I'm in a dangerous spot. I'm in a... Uh, in a in a kind of a rough area here but and i understand that but i'm still deciding to move forward because the spirit of compassion is compelling me it's literally pulling me off of my animal and i've got to see about this man now not worrying about lack and what he doesn't have rather than making excuses and saying oh i don't have the proper medication to put on his wounds. I don't have the proper bandages. I don't have this. I don't have that. He didn't look at what he didn't have. He looked at, he looked at what was in his hand, right? Old Testament, uh, where, where Moses is challenged by God and says, what is in your hand? 
and what God was saying to Moses then and what he what he's saying to you now don't worry about the things that are outside of your control don't worry about lack look at what is in your hand even when the prophet went to the woman my god he said to her what do you have here in the house i'm not asking you to go get something that you don't have i'm asking you to use what i've already given you and this is what the man puts into practice he says i don't have a first aid kit i don't have the everything that's needed, but I've got oil and I've got wine. And he, the Bible says he poured in his own oil, willing to give of his own resources, right? Willing to give of himself and give of his own resources. He pours in oil, he pours in wine. And then the Bible says he set him on his own beast. And now they have traded places. Isn't it funny how some people want to help you long enough until you're on the same level as them, they're willing to help you, right? But they don't want to. They don't want you to uh, to 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 elevate higher than them. They don't want you to pass them. This man didn't have that spirit. He didn't say, "Hey, buddy, listen, I'll help you get to where you need to go, but you can't get on my animal. You can't you can't ride my donkey because uh, that that's it's, it belongs. That's not that wasn't his attitude." He puts the man where he was, again, forgetting about himself, not even knowing if this man can repay these services, pours in oil and wine without even, without even considering, can he repay me for this, right? So he administered care and first aid, puts the man on his animal. Really quick before we move on. I want to I wanna ask you all a question. What do you think happens after he puts on that last bandage on the last wound? He could have easily said, I've done all I can do. I've got to go now. I've got a journey to make myself. I stopped. I checked on you. I bandaged you up but I got to be on my way. What happens if he leaves the man and says, well, I've done my part, but this is where it stops for me. Someone else will have to do the rest. He recognized that I've only addressed a part of ministry. I've only addressed a part of this man's life. I addressed what happened to him in the past when he was beaten and he has the wounds and the scars to show it, right? I addressed what happened to him then, but what about right now? He's still in a dangerous place. And he was cognizant enough to recognize if I leave him here, I am leaving him in a never ending cycle. Ministers, pastors, leaders, I'm challenging you all consider this. Don't just bandage the people up uh, regarding their past. But make sure that you are changing and endeavoring to change their status, right? Because if he leaves him there, he leaves him to the thieves and the robbers, and the cycle happens again. Now, sure, they've already stripped him and robbed him, but they could come back and beat him again. They could come back and hurt him again. And if they don't kill him, he's back in the same spot where he he was. But he, this man, this Samaritan recognizes that restoration and ministry is a process. It's not a quick fix. It's not something that is just going to happen overnight. We're talking about foolproof, a foolproof ministry. I'm going to address what happened to you in the past, and I'm going to address where you currently are. So let's get you out of here. I can't bandage you up and leave you in this bad spot, right? So he's understanding and he's willing to take the next steps on the path to restoration and being willing to execute them. It's not enough to just know the steps, but you've got to be willing to execute, right? So even though now the man was in better shape, he still wasn't in good shape. His wounds have been bandaged up but his environment has not changed. 
He is still in a dangerous place. He is still at risk of being attacked and beaten again. Let's take a look really quick at where the man was. Okay. He was on a road that leads from Jerusalem to Jericho. I'm not going to take too much time here. Feel free to do some more research on this in your own time. But just to kind of give you an idea, Jerusalem's height is approximately 2,500 feet above sea level. Again, Jesus alluded to it when he said that we, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Jerusalem is literally 25 feet above sea level. It's, it's a high place. It's elevated, right? In contrast to that, Jericho is about 850 feet below sea level. So in that short geographical space, the, the descent from Jerusalem down to Jericho is about six-tenths of a mile. Not even a full mile. It's a short walk. It's a short distance. But because you are going from one extreme to another, you're going from a high place to a low place, it is a very dangerous road with all types of curves and slopes and all types of places to be ambushed. And the, uh, even in my research and my study, I found that oftentimes uh, your vision is blocked. Uh, because of uh, the, the fog and, you know, again, leaving that elevated place going down to the low place, it's just a dangerous road, so much so uh, that people uh, in that area started calling it the bloody path or the road of blood because so much violence used to take place on this road from Jerusalem to Jericho. So the man recognizes that. The Samaritan says, even though I have banded you up and taken care of you, I can't leave you here. How many of you are willing to go that extra mile and complete the full process of ministry and make sure the people that you are assigned to and called to are, are taking those necessary steps on the path to restoration? I really believe in my heart there are several ministries out there there are several churches out there. There are several, several pastors and leaders out there who have been bandaging up the people they're called to, and they are simply taking off and leaving them there. Oh, we're willing to go out and feed the homeless, but we're not called to find them housing. Come on. I know that's tough. But this is what the Lord impressed upon my heart. We got to make sure that we're endeavoring to do the full work. And someone would, may say, well, I'm not called to that. I'm not, that's not my area. I'm only called to do this part or what have you. Okay, if that's what the Lord has spoken to you, I would, I, I would not dare to argue with that. But I believe that there are some of us who God is pulling on in this season to do more to do more and to go that next step, right? Don't just bandage up these people, but move them out of that place. Be willing to switch places with them. I'm going to put you on my animal and I'm going to walk because I see that there is a need that I can meet. God has sent me here to help you in this area, okay? So verse 34 says, Again, he went to him, he bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an end. Look at how he changes his status. I've addressed your past with regards to how you were beating, uh, beaten. Now I'm going to address your present with regards to how you are here in a dangerous place where this can happen to you all over again. So right now, now, I'm going to move you from A to B. I'm going to move you from the dangers of the road into the comfort and the safety of the inn. Isn't that like the Lord our God? He will always lift us up and take us out of that dangerous place. David put it this way. He has delivered my soul. He has taken my feet out of the muck and the miry clay. He took the man from the dangerous road and brought him to the end and then took care of him. 
foolproof ministry, complete work, a complete work. I'm going to remove you from where you are, take you to an end, and then I'm going to take care of you. Again, he addressed his past. He just addressed his present. Now we're going to talk about the man's future and how he addressed that. Verse 35 says, and on the morrow, which means the next day, when the Samaritan departed, he took out two pence or two denarii, which was a day's wage back in that time, okay? And gave them to the host and said unto him, take care of him and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. My God, that is so beautiful. He left nothing undone. He did not take the easy route and just say, well, I've done enough. I bandaged him up. I've got to be on my way. Well, I brought him to the end. I took care of him. Now I got to be on my way. He did everything that he could do in his power to make sure that this man was whole again, to make sure that this man was fully restored. Not only am I willing to care for you, sir, in private when it's just us in the privacy of our room in the inn, but now I have become your advocate. Again, are you willing to take that extra step? I have become your advocate in the presence of another. Have you ever been around anyone? Go ahead. You can raise your hand. I know people may look at you like you're crazy. It's okay. It's just us right now. You can raise your hand. Anybody ever been around those people who will help you when no one's looking and they're on your side and they're your best friend when it's just y'all, but then when other people come around, they don't have that same spirit of compassion and they, don't, they act like they don't know you? That man did not operate in that, that particular spirit. The Samaritan didn't have that in his heart. He said, not only am I going to take care of you when it's just us, I still have a journey that I've got to take. I still have to be about my business. Again, no one is asking you to abandon your journey. But I do believe that God is calling for the body of Christ to alter their journey a little bit and take the time to see people restored fully. Okay? Now, again, let me get back here. He has become an advocate and he has recruited another man to assist him in helping this, this gentleman fully recover. I've got to stay focused. I want you to take a note of this, okay? Notice that the good Samaritan continued on his journey. He never turned back. He remained focused on what he was doing and where he was going while he was helping the man. Again, didn't abandon his own journey, but altered it remained focused the entire time, going in the same direction that he was prior to coming across this man. There's a message, message in that itself. Continue on with the same focus. Even though God has called you to perhaps do something else that you were not expecting, that initial assignment still must be completed. That initial journey has to be completed. All right? I'm going to move on from there. But because he truly cared about this man's well-being, because he truly cared about this man's recovery, and because he wanted to see him totally healed, completely made whole, I have now recruited someone to step in my place while I continue on with my business. Isn't that beautiful? That I care about you enough, even though I've got to leave you, I'm leaving you in the hands of someone who is more than capable of taking care of you. Do we not see the gospel in this? Do we not see the life of Jesus in this? I know I can. I believe that in the midst of Jesus telling this parable, and while it meant a host of other things, it was also symbolism. It was also symbolic of his life and his relationship with us. 
I submit to you, brothers and sisters, that we all had fallen among thieves. Satan and his devils and his demons and the wiles of sin beat us, stripped us of our raiment, and left us half dead. And along came Jesus, who took our place. Come on. He switched places with us. He wrapped himself in flesh, came down and walked on the earth for 33 years. The same way that the man put the, the same way the Samaritan put the man on his own beast, they switched places. Jesus continues on his journey and pays the price to the innkeeper, pays the ultimate price by giving his life and says, not if I return, but when, come on, you missed it. Not if I come again, but when I come again, I will repay thee. I am saying to you, every pastor, every leader, apostles, prophets, those who have been entrusted, the lambs and the sheep of God, the people of God, you in many ways have walked into the calling of the innkeeper. And it is your job, it is your calling, it is your assignment to see this work through. Continue taking care of God's people until that man returns. Continue nursing them back to health. Paul's put it this way. He gave some apostles and some pastors and some teachers and some evangelists and some prophets. He gave these things for the perfecting of the church. And I believe that we are to work together, be advocates for God's people, be advocates for the people that we are called to and assigned to, recruit others to work in our stead when we have to move on, when we get a little tired, but the work cannot cease, the work cannot stop. We have been entrusted with God's most precious commodity. It's not money. I heard T.D. Jake say, money means nothing to God. Here's what God thinks of money. He paved the streets with gold. He, he wants us to walk on it when we get up there. He could care less about it, but he cares about his people. And the Samaritan entrusts this man's life. He entrusts this man's process of recovery and healing into the hands of the innkeeper and pays him, gives him a reward, and says, even if, you, if, even if you spend more, when I come again, I'll repay thee. Is that not Christ telling the church, help these people, no matter the color, the race, the sex, no matter who it is, if you see someone who has fallen among thieves, I'm calling you to alter your journey. I'm calling you to help these people as the Samaritan helped the man. Look at the complete work. Again, the topic is a foolproof ministry. He addressed the man's past, he addressed his present, and he even addressed his future by telling the innkeeper, I've got to go. But in the future days, he may need something else. I'm giving you this money to take care of him. Look at how he was willing. Now, we're getting ready to close in just a moment, but I've got to go here. How often have people said they are willing to help you until money is involved? Oh, come on. We've all been there. How often have certain ministries or uh, organizations even, have, they've, they've committed to prayer and intercession and, and they're willing to lay hands and they're willing to preach and they are all for collecting tithe. But when it's time to sow back into the community, when it's time to sow back into a worthy cause, they get alligator arms and say, I'm... I'm, I'm sorry, we, we've got to delegate those funds elsewhere. And don't get me wrong, there are times where God will have the church. And I don't want anybody to walk away from this broadcast thinking that the church is supposed to finance your life and your bills. That's not what I'm saying. But there are times, and again, I'm challenging 
you to change your way of thinking, especially leaders. There are times where you know you have heard the voice of God. You know you have been unctioned by him to sow into a particular cause or to sow into a particular uh, ministry outside of your own. But you decide that you know best. You decide to hold back when God is saying release and give. Look at the foolproof ministry of the Samaritan. He completed everything, past, present, future, and willing to give of his own resources with the oil and wine and willing to give of his own money and willing to give of his own time. That, my friends, that believers is a foolproof ministry. Going back to our key verse as we close, again, Paul told Timothy to first watch thou in all things. Look at the order. Don't just read, but pay attention to the details that you may normally miss. He didn't just give him one thing to do. He gave him multiple things to do, and then he put it in a particular order. He told him to first watch, and then he said endure. Then he said do the work of an evangelist, and he stopped right there. He didn't say anything else, right? No. He continued on. He gave him a fourth thing. And I believe, unfortunately, to the detriment of God's people and to the detriment of the body of Christ, many of us have stopped at that third thing. At that third thing. We're watching like nobody's business. Oh, my God, we are on the wall, eyes peeled, looking for the wolf. We're watching in all things. We're enduring afflictions. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I can, I can take this. I can endure. We're doing the work of an evangelist. Nobody can win souls like us. Man, we can, we can, get, people, we can get people to the altar and help them uh, receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and help them be converted. But Paul also gave that fourth instruction and said, make full proof of thy ministry. There's more to be done, people of God. You're watching, you're enduring inflictions, you're doing the work of an evangelist, but are you making full proof of your ministry? In closing, I want to say this. Ministry is not just telling people the day of the Lord is at hand. Repent now and be baptized and saved. The Lord is soon to come. Consider the work and the life of Noah, right? Noah preached and prophesied and told the people that the rain was coming. But in the midst of him preaching and prophesying, he also built an ark as a place of safety and refuge for the people. God has put it in my spirit and told me that many are preaching and prophesying, but no one is, who, who's building the ark? Who's building a safe place? to escape the impending doom that you're prophesying about. I believe that not everyone, again, this may not be for you. Some of you are going to may perhaps say, I'm not called to that. That's not, if it's not for you, God bless you. You do the will of the Lord in the manner in which he's telling you to do it. But for those of you who feel that fire burning and you feel God challenging you right now, I believe that there are people who have been anointed and called to build in the earth realm. Not just win souls, but build something here for the people on earth. Noah prophesied, but he built the ark. Nehemiah built the wall. What have your hands been anointed to do? What work is lying waste as you refuse to get to work? and put your hands on the thing that God is calling you to. Consider this. Many people touched the wall that was in ruins and torn down before Nehemiah touched it. But after Nehemiah touched it, the wall was never the same. Never the same. There was a work that is waiting for you. There was a work that is calling out to you. And once you are willing and committed to put your hands on it, that work, that thing, whatever it is, will never be the same. Jesus' ministry was foolproof. He preached, 
but he also addressed earthly needs. He was constantly showing people that he came in contact with, I care about your soul, but I love you enough to help you with your earthly needs as well. I'm going to open your eyes, blind man. I'm going to heal your skin disease, leper. I'm going to dry up your issue of blood, woman. After he was done preaching, he didn't just send the people away hungry, but he sat them down on the grass and fed them with a little boy's lunch. This is what we're talking about when we say foolproof ministry. So I encourage you today, examine yourself, examine the work that you have been called to, and make sure, be sure that you're making foolproof of what God is asking you to do. Do not be afraid to help someone. Do not be afraid to help a group of people who have perhaps fallen amongst thieves. No one again is asking you to abandon your journey, but God is calling for you to alter it. Will you answer that call? Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this time that has been well spent. We believe that your word is not going to return unto you void. It will go out and accomplish all that you want it to. We believe that it is going to pierce the hearts of somebody to encourage them and to light a fire under them to do more. Perhaps they have bandaged up some wounds and walked away. We're asking you right now to turn them around. Send them back to that man, that woman, that group of people that they're called to and help them complete the work. Help them to make full proof of their ministry. We're praying now for your people. We need you, Lord, like never before. We're asking you in your name, Jesus, oh God, to send and raise up even more people to come, oh God, and put their hands on things in the earth. Put their hands on their wall, whatever it be. Whatever it is, oh God, we understand that ministry is not just in within the four walls of the church, but it is for us to go out into the world and help in any way that we can. We ask you, God, to raise up soldiers. We ask you, oh God, to help us be like Jacob when the, the young men, his sons, came and told him that Joseph had been attacked by a beast and they put the coat in the hands of Jacob. The Bible says that he put himself in slack cloth and ashes. And when they came to comfort him from his grieving, the Bible says he refused to be consoled. Glory to God. He refused to be comforted. We are looking for people. I believe you, God, are looking for people who refuse to be comforted in these times. They refuse to be consoled because they know that they are called to do more than they are doing. The season of grieving, the season of being sad and downtrodden is over. We must now take action and do all that you're calling us to do. We must make full proof of our ministry. Yes, we are called to preach and teach, but we're also called to fight for change. You cared about justice in the Bible days, and you care about it now. And it may not be for everybody, but for some of you, glory to God, who are sitting there wondering, is it my time to step outside of the realm of what I know and follow the voice of God? God is saying to you, yes, he is saying go. We believe God that this word will go out and be a blessing to your people. We give your name all the praise, all the glory and honor belongs to you. And we believe that it is so. We shall have a foolproof ministry. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray. Amen. God bless you. And we cannot wait to see you again. And uh, I hope that this word has richly blessed you on today. God bless you. God bless you, uh, Brother Tyreek. I thank God for you. The word was so enriched. Uh, make foolproof thy ministry. Uh, when the Lord did it, he did it not just to that of our past, our present, but he's also concerned for our future. I'm inspired today. I know that several of you that have been watching with us um, were likely moved in, in like terms. And so I want to encourage you to get behind the word that has been spoken over your life and into your hearts. And let's go ahead and move in action now. All right. Let's not just be hearers, but doers of the word. Amen. Thank you again for, uh, 
allowing the Lord to just use you in a mighty and powerful way. I'm reminded likewise, even the more that the work uh, continues on before beyond the first connection and that it takes time and we need be patient Amen. in the process. Um, thank you so much for allowing the Lord to use you. Speaking of which, family, uh, listen, I shared with you at the top of the hour that there was a few announcements I wanted to make. Um, and we have only but begun. Uh, you know, we're in a new season and uh, we are taking on all that God has given us to do in this season. And so not only am I reporting to you the first announcement that we were able to successfully um, serve uh, 700 and what is it, 773 uh, individuals for that mm -hmm. of a week um, meals, but we are praising God for, you know, not just meeting our objective, but exceeding such. In fact, the month is not over yet, and we're already seeing that we're likely to surpass a thousand before this month concludes. And grateful to that end. Now, again, this is only the first step of great many others that will come because we don't just want to meet the need, but we want to help that person in turn mm -hmm. uh, beyond such and help them to get back on their feet likewise. Uh, second thing, listen, if you're looking for content, if you're looking for um, something specific, uh, perhaps you're in a relationship or you're married, um, which means you're in a relationship <laughs> or you're endeavoring to get into one, um, I want you to stay tuned. Uh, uh, in the next uh, day or so, we're going to hear from Team Lee. They're going to be speaking on the subject um, of the weight of the weight. Um, it's our marriage edition. It's uh, behind closed doors, marriage insider. It's going to go down. I want you to be a part of that. Look for it here on our network, our channel, and uh, be a part of that experience. It's going to be interactive. So get ready to uh, meet them and also hear, um, you know, what they have to present. Uh, last thing I want to let you know coming up next week, and I don't try to date these videos, but I have to on this particular one because coming up next week, that is July 1st. Guess what? We're moving into the sanctuary. We're having our first midweek, first Wednesday worship experience. And so mm -hmm. once a month, starting in July 2020, uh, we'll be having at 7 p.m. our live uh, there on campus uh, worship experience at the city and then but we'll also be doing it live here on uh youtube for you so or facebook rather so you don't have to um feel like you've lost anything if you're not able to in part make it out to be with us um and then thereafter we'll continue virtually so want to make sure that you're connected i hope i didn't mess it up for you all again thank you so much um listen it, the prayers all have been prayed and we're excited amen i don't want to take any more time from you i appreciate you connecting don't forget to like and subscribe if it's if it has not been done in part already um if you're new to this channel thank you so much welcome to the core experience once again uh to sow a seed be um be a partaker in the vision and the movement of this house um information will be on screen once again for you god bless you thank you so much can't wait to see you again thank you so much brother tariq god bless my pleasure god bless you all